Hello again and welcome to another of our meditations on the tabernacle. We're into our third series now, looking at the Mirarite responsibility. Today we're going to combine two of their areas of responsibility and we're going to look at firstly the veil pillars. Secondly, we're going to look at the silver sockets that were both under those veil pillars and the silver sockets that were under the boards that went around the holy place and the most holy place. For our scripture reading, let's go to Numbers chapter 3, verses 35 to 37. These, that is the Merarites, these shall pitch on the side of the tabernacle northward, and under the custody and charge of the sons of Merari shall be the boards of the tabernacle, and the bars thereof, and the pillars thereof, and the sockets thereof, and all the vessels thereof, and all that serveth thereto, and the pillars of the court round about, and their sockets, and their pins, and their cords. And a further reading in Exodus chapter 26, verses 31 to 33. And thou shalt make a veil of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen of cunning work, with cherubim shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy place. And we know as always that God is pleased to bless to us the reading of his most precious. Word. Here then is our artist's impression of what the tabernacle might have looked like from the outside and today we're going to go right within that holy place uh, between the holy place and the most holy place to see the pillars that held up the veil their silver sockets and also consider the silver sockets used to hold up the boards round about the holy place and the most holy place. Here on our drawing, we have a blue coloured area, which is the holy place and our arrow pointing to the veil and the veil as to what it might have looked like is shown to the right. You'll see there the three curtains that we dealt with in our second study because we saw that that curtain, the veil itself, the material was the Kohathite responsibility. And we looked at that in series number two. There are, however, some details about the veil that we still need to look at. And I'm combining two studies today because we're going to look at the pillars, the four pillars that were made of shitting wood overlaid with gold, the four sockets of silver that held them up, and also consider the 48 boards round about the holy place and the most holy place where we saw those boards with their two tenons, each in two sockets of silver. So there were 96 sockets of silver round about the, the boards that surrounded the holy place and the most holy place. The silver that was used for the supporting of these four pillars and the boards around the holy place and the most holy place into their sockets of silver, this silver was obtained from the ransom money or atonement money that was collected from the Israelites and just so that we can see where this portion of scripture is and what it says I'm going to read you at this point from Exodus chapter 30 verse 11 onwards Exodus 30 verse 11 and the Lord spake unto Moses saying when thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among you, when thou numberest them, and they shall give every one that passeth among them, that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is twenty gerahs, and half shekel shall be of the offering of the Lord. Every one that passeth among them, that are numbered from twenty years old and above, shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, 
and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And that concludes the reading there, that last verse, Exodus chapter 30, verse 16. I trust that this helps us to understand why we refer to the atonement money or the sockets of silver as the, the redemption price that was paid for each Israelite coming out of Egypt and going into the promised land. Peter summarises this so beautifully in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18, familiar words I'm sure to most of us, where he says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter is thinking about the price of redemption and he refers back to these days in Israel's history, no doubt thinking about the atonement money or the redemption money and says here that that couldn't redeem you, couldn't buy you back to God, only the precious blood of the Lord Jesus can. And what a wonderful foundation it is to think that, as we saw in our first study, these boards were pictures of the believer holding up the outer coverings of the tabernacle. And here at the middle veil, we have these pillars holding up the veil and how they, they speak of our responsibility and clearly represent the believer. And the only standing that the believer has is in Christ, not only in Christ, but most importantly, the fact that he has redeemed us. He's brought us back to God with that ultimate price. No greater price could ever be paid, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. So what does the number four relate to in these pillars? Four is a universal number. We know that there are four points to the compass, north and south, east and west. We know that there are four gospel records. And I want us to think perhaps in a devotional way that these pillars holding up this veil here could represent the person of the Lord Jesus. When we looked at this veil curtain, the fabric material, we saw that how that was clearly defined for us in the scriptures in the Hebrew letter, the veil, that is to say, his flesh, the flesh of the Lord Jesus. And who in the New Testament, in their writings, held up the, the life of the Lord Jesus from his coming in at Bethlehem to his going out from the Mount of Olives. They are the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Each of those gospel writers writes about the same person, but from a different viewpoint, as we might say. Matthew looks at him from the viewpoint of the promised king to the nation of Israel. His gospel is all about a king and a coming kingdom. We have the Sermon on the Mount, as it's often referred to, the manifesto of the kingdom. We have the kingdom parables unique to Matthew's gospel and so on and we know that Matthew starts with the wise men coming from the east and they come inquiring where is he that is born king of the Jews we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him so the gospel writer Matthew sets forth the Lord Jesus as the king when we come to the second pillar and we might think of the gospel of mark remember mark wasn't an eyewitness of the lord jesus no doubt received much of his material from the apostle peter but mark the once unfaithful servant is called by the call of the apostle to follow in the work of god and 
the servant that started out badly uh, finishes well and he writes about the Lord Jesus as the perfect servant. When we come to the third pillar, we might think of the gospel writer Luke, also of course wrote the Acts of the Apostles, and Luke sets before us the perfections of the man, the perfect man. And we love to think of the gospel writer Luke as he sets before us that lovely characteristic of the Lord Jesus as the perfect man. The final pillar, the fourth, perhaps representative of the Gospel of John. And we remember that John was an eyewitness and he writes in a different manner to all of the other Gospel writers. And he doesn't start with the birth of the Lord Jesus. He starts, it were, in eternity. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made and John is the gospel of the sevens the seven testimonies that the Lord Jesus is the son of God the seven great statements of the I am and they all reflect to us the ever existent one the Jehovah the I am that I am the one that is God and yet in wondrous grace was manifest in flesh. And John says that in his gospel, chapter one, uh, verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, says John, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So four pillars, perhaps a picture of the four gospel writers and they hold up the testimony of the Lord Jesus. Now, one thing you'll know as you read through the gospel narratives, uh, each of the gospel writers takes us to the death of the Lord Jesus. Not one of them misses it. And we'll read references to a temple veil in the gospel records. And what we will read about the temple veil is that it was rent in twain from the top to the bottom when the Lord Jesus cried in triumph those words, it is finished. Now, this isn't the temple, this is the tabernacle. And there's one thing I want you to observe as you look at the pillars. They weren't like most pillars, finished off with a capita at the top, no. They are just straight pillars of shittim wood overlaid with pure gold and as we've seen in those materials they are reflective of the Lord Jesus too and we saw in the boards that they're reflective of the Lord Jesus but we saw them in a great practical sense as pictures of ourselves and as we've seen those pillars as pictures of the gospel writers Matthew Mark Luke and John then clearly they are there representing men individuals and yet setting forth the work of the Lord Jesus. One thing you know that the gospel writers do do is that they set forth a finished work. Could I suggest to you that these pillars, the fact that they had no capitals at the top, they were perhaps seen in an unfinished state. And you know that's how they must have been in that tabernacle and later in the temple that was built by Solomon. They anticipated that day of triumph when the Lord Jesus would cry from the cross, it is finished. And the veil was shown to be inadequate to bar presence between man and God forever. Yes, it was a physical barrier here in the days of the tabernacle in the wilderness and the, the later temple. Only one man and once a year dared to go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies and to come in on that great day of Israel's national cleansing. And he came, no doubt, in fear and trepidation as he came into that inner sanctuary where God dwelt between the cherubim above the mercy seat. But you see, it was only temporary. 
it was temporary until Christ would make a way possible for there to be no restriction and for a redeemed people to come into the very presence of God and to come boldly, as the scripture says in Hebrews, to come boldly to the throne of grace, that there we can find mercy and grace to help in every time of need. So perhaps reflective of that unfinished work at this stage, waiting for the final culmination when the veil would be rent and the veil would be no more. I've probably said it before in these meditations on the tabernacle that the letter to the Hebrews sets forth the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament tabernacle spoke about. And in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11 we read that Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. There's the silver. But here is an eternal redemption for us. And we're glad, aren't we, today that we can look back to Calvary and think of the answer, the final answer that all of this anticipated when the Lord Jesus would offer himself up and he would lay down his own life and through that the shedding of his precious blood obtain eternal redemption for us that standing that we have in Christ beloved is firm it never can be shaken never can be moved those solid sockets of silver that formed the basis for these pillars that held up the veil and those pillars that held up the boards that went around the holy place and the most holy place, that all stood firm in sockets of silver. Interesting to think that in total there were a hundred sockets. That is when you went to school, and it still is the same today, ten lots of ten. And we know that there were ten commandments. Ten speaks in scripture of responsibility God would and responsibility man would. What we see in this is that what we could not attain to, those Ten Commandments in themselves, we have seen oftentimes that we can't attain to them, we can't even hope to, but all of the standing that we have in Christ enables us as believers to stand upon his merits. And like the hymn writer, we can stay, say, I stand upon his merit. I have no other stand, not e'en where glory dwelleth, in Emmanuel's land. And you know that scene almost in those verses that we read from Exodus chapter 30, where we're told that the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less. This shows to us the work of another exactly meets every individual's need. Those that feel they have plenty and can perhaps contribute something for themselves, they have to learn that they can't. All the work is done by another, the payment has been made by another. And the poor might feel so inadequate and unable to draw near, but again, they appreciate that it's not upon their own efforts, but it's on the work of another. And that's just how we come to the Lord Jesus. Whether rich or poor, we come claiming that we have nothing and we depend totally upon the work of the Lord Jesus. As we looked at those 48 boards on a previous study and looking today at these four pillars and we have seen that the silver bases upon which each stand represents the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus and how the silver that came to make those sockets came from every male from 20 years old and upwards. Again, it shows that every individual Israelite was represented in the tabernacle here. And each socket was part of that collective company's contribution of the atonement money. And therefore each had their standing together. I'll just close this meditation with a few more devotional thoughts. And to think of the Lord Jesus as our Redeemer, as we think of those silver sockets. We've thought of them 
been made of the atonement money or the ransom price that was there uh, offered for the deliverance of the Israelites. The males paid it from 20 years old and upwards. And I love the language that's recorded for us in the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 33, verse 24, where we read the words, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. We often think of the ransom that used to be required when people were taken uh, hostage or planes were taken by hijackers and a ransom price would de be demanded to let the captives go free and it's a lovely way of thinking of what the Israelites were in Egypt when they were in slavery in captivity they came out yes by the blood of the lamb and that was seen in the crossing of the Red Sea but they paid each of them individually this half shekel and as we've seen the silver shekel of the sanctuary was then used to make these pillars upon which these heavy boards and pillows stood the word ransom appears in the new testament on two occasions virtually identical verses in matthew chapter 20 verse 28 and mark chapter 10 verse 45 even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many I hear you saying, but there is a third reference, isn't there? And you'll be right. And the reason why I've just given you two so far is actually the Greek word that is used in 1 Timothy is actually different. So the two references that I've given you from Matthew and Mark has the idea of setting free. It literally means to loosen. And that's a lovely way of describing the deliverance that the children of Israel knew from being in Egypt, where they were in bondage, in captivity, bound to be set free and on their way to the promised land. The verse in 1 Timothy I will come to now, and that has the thought of redemption actually in the down payment made for the release of a captive. Let me read to you those two verses from 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And as I've said already, the thought of that word there is the payment made, the redemptive price paid to set someone free. not wanting to give you any lessons in Greek because I'm not qualified to do that because I don't understand it myself. I can just use the helpful aids that there are around. But that word for ransom in 1 Timothy there that we've just looked at has its source from two Greek words. And that is very interesting in itself because one of them literally means that someone has done something in the place of, in the room of, instead of, as a substitute for. And doesn't that reflect beautifully the work of the Lord Jesus for us? And interestingly, the other Greek word that is the root of the one that we've just seen in 1 Timothy is the same word that is used in Matthew 20 verse 28 and Mark chapter 10 verse 45 that we've thought of earlier, the idea of loosing. So just to bring the two together, we have been set free, we have been liberated, but it hasn't been something that's been without a price. A great price was paid. There was a ransom, there was a monetary payment necessary for the Israelites to get into the land. And there was a price paid for us. We were helpless and useless and bankrupt we had nothing to contribute, but it was all done by the work of the Lord Jesus. And so we'll close off today just rejoicing again in the salvation that is ours in Christ and ever give thanks for him and for his sacrifice at Calvary, the shedding of his most precious blood.
Finally, then, my last slide, which shows that the images used in this series are from Free Bible Images, and the author is there shown. Next time, in the Word of the Lord, we'll look at the, the pillars that were overlaid in gold and set in sockets of brass that formed the door of the holy place. But until then, may God richly bless you, and goodbye for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching.